Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 4 of the Cathar Crusade, the Battle of Mude. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained in part 3, Simon de Montfort, a noble with little wealth but great military ability, had taken command of the crusade. Through the efficient employment of newly arrived crusaders during their 40 days and the skillful application of cutting-edge technology like a trebuchet, Montfort captured two more Cathar sanctuaries, Menev and Tem, which resulted in more bonfires for Cathars and the expansion of his lands. Fearing that he would lose all of his territory to this fierce crusader and his land-hungry followers, Count Raymond of Toulouse attempted to reconcile with the church. Although he was supported by his brother-in-law, King Pedro of Aragon, Raymond knew that a return to the loving embrace of the church would not come cheap. But he was prepared to pay nearly any price. Unwilling to see the crusade end, papal legate Amari imposed an impossible set of conditions, including exile to Palestine. So Raymond accepted that he would have to fight to defend his lands against the northern invaders. Despite his remarkable string of victories, Montfort became increasingly ruthless because he had few reliable followers. Instead, he was dependent on a constantly changing group of 40-day volunteers, which naturally made him distrustful of others. A genuine believer, the nature of his position made him lonely, so he became distant, treating followers well, but developing few intimate friends. Continuing his campaign to conquer the Languedoc, Montfort targeted Laveur, which fell after a month-long siege where the walls were breached by catapults under the direction of Father William. When Laveur was finally captured, Montfort had Emmerich of Montréal hung as a criminal rather than beheaded, because he had repeatedly broken his word, while 80 of his knights were also hung. Amadic's defiance was natural, since the lady of Laveur was his sister Geralda, and their mother was Blanche of Lorac, a major Cathar leader. Three of their siblings were perfects, and Geralda was famous for her generosity to the poor, but Montfort had her thrown down a well and then dropped stones on her. Having given up on conversion, Amari simply threw 400 perfects onto a huge bonfire on May 1st, 1211. The conflict did not always favor the invaders. Shortly after taking Laveur and butchering his defenders, Montfort learned that a large force of German crusaders marching from Carcassonne to join him had been ambushed and slaughtered by the Count de Foix. The people of Toulouse had been divided in loyalty between the Count and and Montfort until Montfort announced his plan to attack the city, and the blatant aggression of the crusaders united the citizens of Toulouse behind Count Raymond. Possibly the powerful Count Theobald of Bar had made the announcement on his own, wanting an impressive victory during his forty days, and Montfort had supported the plan in the hope that the Count and his men would stay longer than the usual forty days. Reinforced by the Count's men, Montfort led roughly 4,000 men to Toulouse on June 17th. While it was a sizable army, it was too small to actually lay siege to a city with at least 30,000 inhabitants and an experienced militia of two to 4,000 men. So Montfort gave up and ended the siege 10 days later. Actually, his decision to support the Count's siege of Toulouse was a major error. Aside from wasting resources and the brief availability of a large army on a doomed siege, he managed to unite the feuding factions behind the Count, thus ending the city as a source of recruits and supplies. News of the departure of much of Montfort's army soon reached Count Raymond. Seeing an opportunity, he summoned his vassals and hired a thousand mercenaries. As he advanced, several of Montfort's garrisons either surrendered or fled. When a crusader convoy was blocked by a powerful southern force under the Count of Foix at Castle Naudry, the outnumbered crusaders were losing until Montfort surprised both sides by appearing with his knights. If he was defeated in the battle, he would lose everything, but he made a risky gamble. The gamble paid off. Brave and aggressive, the Count of Foix did not give up easily, but many of his allies panicked in the face of the more disciplined northern knights and retreated. It is worth stressing that Montfort was an outlier since most leaders of the time saw battles as unnecessary risks that should be avoided at all cost. 
However, Montfort seemed to have figured out how to make battles work in his favor. Regardless of his military victories, castles continued to switch sides, showing that Montfort had failed to win the loyalty of the local lords. By the winter of 1211, the war had reached stalemate, but neither side would give up. The spring of 1212 was fruitless. Montfort only captured two minor castles, but was routinely shadowed by southerners, who avoided battle, but ambushed any exposed troops. While nobles were choosing to join the Spanish crusade called by the King of Castile in January, Montfort survived long enough to receive a surprising number of noble recruits from northern France, Germany, and Lombardy in the spring, due to the oratory of the clerics preaching the crusade. These reinforcements enabled Montfort to capture the daunting castle Otpol on April 12th after a siege convinced the garrison to flee during the night. In fact, he received even more men in May, including a contingent led by Duke Leopold of Austria, allowing Montfort to organize two separate armies to capture even more castles. Taking advantage of his enlarged army, Montfort invaded the Agenais, which Raymond had received as Joan's dowry and now held for his son, who was a minor. The region was not considered Cathar territory, confirming that the crusade had simply become a land grab. Montfort attacked the fortress of Pen d'Agenais, held by Hugh of Alfaro, a Spanish mercenary who had married one of Raymond's illegitimate daughters, an example of a mercenary entering the local nobility. Determined to defend the fortress, he had recruited 400 mercenaries. When the Duke of Austria left to aid King Pedro of Aragon against the Muslims, Montfort had to recall the second army under his brother Guy that was raiding Foix. However, despite Hugh's efforts, the water ran out, the besiegers were not leaving, and Raymond was either unable or unwilling to aid his son-in-law, so he surrendered in July. Mosaic, the next target, proved harder to take, but the townspeople finally surrendered, agreeing to hand over the mercenaries and the soldiers from Toulouse, so 300 men were executed. Mosaic's surrender on September 8 meant that Raymond had lost everything except for Toulouse and Monoban. Toulouse itself was bursting with refugees, landless lords, mercenaries, and Cathars. It is important to point out that the southerners were not incompetent, while well, they were clearly outmatched in pitched battles which prevented them from relieving major sieges, they more than held their own during the constant raids on each side's territory. Feeling secure, Montfort held a council at Pamiers at the end of the year where 46 articles were drawn up by a commission of 12 men, four crusaders, four churchmen, and four southerners. Religious observance would be mandatory since everyone, including lords, would have to attend mass and observe holy days or pay a fine. However, the key issue was the replacement of the southern legal system, where noble women could choose their husbands, with the northern feudal system where any marriage would require the permission of their overlord, namely Montfort, who could forbid any southern noble women from marrying nobles from the Landoc thus ensuring that the noble families with centuries of roots in the region would disappear. Despite his genuine piety, it became clear that Montfort was interested in carving out a new kingdom rather than rooting out heretics, since the bonfire stopped once papal legate Amari left to become Archbishop of Narbonne. Anyway, the Cathars would be hard to find since they had melted into the population rather than gather openly in large numbers, recognizing that Montfort would simply capture any castle. It was a smart strategy. Rooting them out would be hard work, and Montfort preferred to extend his domains rather than pursue the objective of the crusade that supplied him with legitimacy and recruits. As a zealous crusader, Montfort should have rejoiced when he learned of a major Muslim defeat in Spain, but it threatened to destroy everything that Montfort had built. Well, destroyed and then claimed for himself. Christian crusaders won a stunning victory against the Muslims of Al-Andalus at Las Navas de Tolosa on July 16th, 1212, and Pedro of Aragon had played a leading role in that victory. Even Montfort had fulfilled his obligations and sent 50 knights, while Archbishop Amadi had put on armor and fought on the battlefield. Fresh from his victory, Pedro sought to turn the crusade to his advantage. The cleric's desire to disinherit both Count Raymond and his son had angered many lords. 
Deprived of his admittedly irregular supply of recruits and what for seemed vulnerable, so Pedro prepared to evict the troublesome northerner. Using the threat of Montfort as an excuse, Pedro persuaded all of the lords of the south to swear fealty to him in February. Since his brother Sancho was Count of Provence, the combination of Aragon, Toulouse, and Provence threatened to make a new power that could rival France. Although annoyed by the Aragon king's attempt to take over lordship of Toulouse, King Philip of France was preoccupied with planning an invasion of England. So Pedro had perfect timing. Actually, Pedro's control of the region was shaky, since the city of Montpellier was key and his relationship with the councils was strained. He had gained Montpellier through marriage to Maria de Montpellier, but attempted to annul the marriage in order to marry the heiress to the throne of Jerusalem. Infuriated by the potential annulment, the councils and the people of Montpellier rioted until the king finally abandoned the city in July 1206. The couple reconciled sufficiently to produce a son, but the conflict flared up again afterwards when Pedro attempted to restart the annulment process. As the hero of the hour, Pedro felt that he had earned the right to make a request of Pope Innocent. Abandoning any hope of reconciling his brother-in-law Raymond to the church, he proposed that Raymond relinquish his lands to his young son, while Pedro would administer the lands, scouring them of heretics and raise his nephew to be a faithful son of the church. Furthermore, Montfort would cease his lawless incursions into the lands of Foix, Ben, Comage, and Cousadin, who were Pedro's vassals. Innocent now had to make a choice between his favorite crusaders. The situation seemed favorable, since the Pope suspended preaching for the crusade in mid-January 1213, preferring to focus on another crusade in Palestine. However, Amari had grown to like his power and refused to end the crusade. Rallying the support of the local bishops, he told his recruiters in the north to keep preaching hatred against the Cathars to recruit men for the crusade. Montfort had even more to lose than Amari, so he renounced his fealty to Pedro, publicly declaring his independence from the king of Aragon. After considering the matter, Innocent reinstated the crusade on May 21st, so more 40-day recruits arrived in the summer. Seeing an opportunity since Montfort was visiting Gassoni, Raymond and the Counts of Foix and Comminges laid siege to the Castle Pujol, located just eight miles from Toulouse in May. After a hard-fought siege, the castle fell and all of the members of its garrisons were slaughtered, either during the final attack or they were hung by angry mobs, which shows the deep hatred towards the occupiers. This was the first southerner victory in a long time, and the first successful siege, so momentum seemed to be on their side, especially after they learned that the king of Aragon was coming with an army. After being ignored by the northerners every single time he had attempted to mediate, Pedro finally had an opportunity to avenge his humiliation. As Pedro advanced through Gassoni, many towns and castles defected to him. Consulting with the southerner lords, Pedro decided to attack Mure because it was part of the territory of the Count of Comminges, it was a base for crusader raids, and it was a source of pride for Montfort. The militia of Toulouse brought siege equipment and had soon broken through the walls of Mure. But Pedro stopped the assault because he wanted to lure Montfort into relieving the castle, thus becoming trapped in a siege. As expected, Montfort showed up with his troops, roughly 800 knights and 1,200 foot soldiers and archers. Although Pedro had assembled a huge army for the siege, his cavalry only outnumbered Montfort 2 to 1. While Raymond's battle record was admittedly poor, he did have more experience fighting Montfort, but Pedro ignored his suggestion to build defenses and let the crusaders attack. Actually, his suggestion was treated with contempt by Pedro's nobles. Pedro had accomplished his goal and trapped Montfort in the castle, but rather than surround the castle and either starve them out or wear the crusaders down and take an assault, he let the army come out to fight when it was still fresh, which reeks of overconfidence. While Montfort knew he was outnumbered and faced a dangerous opponent, it should be no surprise that he chose battle since 
he always chose battle. Montfort led roughly a thousand mounted knights, leaving a thousand infantry to hold the castle, against an unknown coalition army which probably had one to two thousand mounted men and two to four thousand infantry, but much of the infantry was probably in the camp, besieging the castle on September 12th. While Pedro should have been in the third reserve rank to direct the battle, he had chosen to be in the second rank, although he wore borrowed armor to avoid attention. Even though it was probably an accident, he died when the crusader's initial charge broke through the first rank to hit the second rank. Clearly, enough Aragonese knew where he was since once he fell, they broke. Unaware that the coalition cavalry had been routed, the Toulouse militia was taking advantage of Montfort's absence to finish what they had started and capture the castle. Bishop Fouque had observed Montfort's crushing victory and tried to warn his former parishioners among the Toulouse militia to leave, but they thought it was a trick and refused. Since no one had warned them of the defeat and Montfort's men were parading captured banners, the militia was taken completely by surprise and slaughtered. Hundreds were killed as the crusaders took revenge for Pujol and the failed siege of Toulouse. Total coalition casualties are unknown, but it was a massive, demoralizing slaughter. Muret is one of the most decisive battles of the period, especially since it was fought by choice rather than by accident like Bouvin. Pedro had clearly been unprepared for the discipline of the crusaders, accustomed to fighting together. I do not mean to take credit away from Montfort, who was brave and aggressive, but not a tactical genius. Pedro had simply failed to take his enemy seriously and led a mixed force of men unaccustomed to fighting together against a smaller but more disciplined and hardened army, and the results had not worked in his favor. I will explain the consequences of Muret in the next episode. Thanks for listening.